have it turned that function off from mine, so we may get those little dings every now and then. Hello everyone. Uh, we will give a couple more minutes for people to uh, join us in the room, but thank you all who've already come in. See, we're at about 22 people who've joined us, which is great. A couple more people coming in. Another minute or two, recognize some names in here. It's great. Hope everyone is uh, warm and cozy tonight after all this mess of weather we've had today. Let's give another minute or so and then we'll get started. Robert, I didn't hear our music. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's all right. I've got my playlist here. <laughs> we can uh, maybe put it on at the end. All right. Um, well, we're coming up to about five minutes after. I think it's probably a good time to start and I'm um, guessing others will join us as we go along. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michelle Williams and I'm joined by uh, panelists here, Brandon Roll, David Curry and Robert Wright, as you can see. Um, unfortunately, uh, something has come up that Professor Maria Duga is not able to join us, uh, but she has very generously um, shared her, her notes and things with us. So I will uh, do my best um, to uh, express her thoughts. Um, uh, as, although we will certainly miss her as an expert in this area uh, tonight. So um, first of all, I wanna welcome you on behalf of the Criminal Justice Coalition here at the Schulich School of Law. Um, and uh, also I'll introduce momentarily uh, the panelists in a little more detail, but just to let you know that if you do go on to the social media uh, pages for the Criminal Justice Coalition, uh, the Instagram, um, you will find Facebook, you will find more detailed um, biographies. I'm not gonna, uh, share everything uh, about people's backgrounds here tonight, just to give you some highlights. And I want to thank uh, Professor Adelina Eftene uh, for both uh, her leadership with the Criminal Justice Coalition and working with students and others uh, and faculty um, in really expanding our offerings around uh, criminal justice here at the Schulich School of Law. So I appreciate uh, her leadership and her invitation for us to join you tonight. So uh, just to get us uh, started with some introductions, I'm gonna start with uh, David Curry, uh, who's here with us tonight, who is a member of the African Nova Scotian community in Lakeel and the Lissigig, if I said that right, Bear River First Nation uh, community. And um, 
again, I'm giving you a truncated version, so I, I recommend the full bio to everybody. Um, but he uh, worked for several years as a staff lawyer with both uh, Legal Aid Ontario and Nova Scotia Legal Aid. Uh, and uh, since 2017 has been a Crown Attorney with the Public Prosecution Service of Nova Scotia, and he works out of the Digby office there. Um, so a little bit about uh, Mr. Curry, thank you for being with us. I am going to uh, give you a little idea about Professor Jiga, even in her uh, absence, um, because she's done extraordinary work uh, in this area. Um, so she is also a graduate of Schulich School of Law and articled at Nova Scotia Legal Aid. Uh, she did both her JD and master's degree uh, at the Schulich School of Law. And she was uh, the first African Nova Scotian person to clerk at the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. Uh, she started her work as an assistant professor um, in uh, 2019, tenure track, and she teaches a uh, torts, legal research and writing, intro to legal ethics, and copyright law. Uh, and her research interests are in the intersection of race and criminal justice. And she's a leading academic expert uh, on IRCAS. And her um, research and analysis was relied upon by the ANS DPED coalition in their intervention in the uh, Anderson decision, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, the next person uh, is Brandon Roll, who's here with us tonight. Also a uh, proud graduate um, associated with the IBM initiative, which I'll mention a little bit later as well. Uh, he joined Nova Scotia Legal Aid uh, in 2013 and since 2017 has been a managing lawyer um, of the Halifax Youth Office and most recently also the adult Justice Office, as I understand. Um, uh, and he's done a lot of work uh, through Nova Scotia Legal Aid on um, access and equity to justice issues. Um, he is a dedicated, part of a dedicated network of IBM alumni who's working on these issues. And um, can, I, can I go public, Brandon? <laughs> so exciting uh, to say publicly um, that he will be continuing this work in the very, very near future as the senior legal counsel with the newly established African Nova Scotian Justice Institutes. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and uh, I'll just introduce myself a little bit more briefly. Uh, I'm a professor or faculty member at the Schulich School of Law, um, teaching uh, criminal law and African Nova Scotians in the law. Uh, and also have an interest um, in uh, critical race theory, uh, restorative justice and other areas. Um, in addition to that work, uh, I also um, co-lead the African Nova Scotian strategy uh, here at Dalhousie, as well as being involved with the African Nova Scotian Decade for People of African Descent Coalition and a number of other projects. So really happy to be here today. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Robert Wright with us. Um, who is a social worker sociologist whose uh, 31 year career has spanned education, child welfare, forensic mental health, uh, trauma, sexual violence, and cultural competence. Um, he uh, does a wide range of work and people probably know of his work, um, including extensive pro bono work that, work that gave rise to the People's Counseling Clinic of, of which he is a director. Um, and is a pioneer, we sort of call him the, the godfather, if you will, of IRCAs uh, in both this province and the country. Um, and he is also serving in an interim capacity as the executive director of the newly established African Nova Scotian Justice Institute. So we are really uh, pleased to be here with you today. We do have um, an option uh, for you to put questions uh, into the discussion board there and Robert will be monitoring those. Uh, so depending on the nature of the questions, we may take them up as we go or um, hold some of them uh, more toward the end of our uh, discussion, but please feel free to put in questions as we're going along. Um, I'm going to uh, begin uh, by talking a little bit about um, African Nova Scotians as a distinct people. Uh, to situate our conversation tonight. Uh, then I will share some of the information that uh, Professor Jiga had sent along about um, statistics about anti-Black racism in the criminal justice system. Uh, and then talk a bit about the, um, briefly about the IBM initiative and its role in a lot of, or the role of its, its alumni, if you will, and students in the development of these innovations. Uh, and then we will continue on uh, throughout our time with you, uh, sort of bouncing back and forth in terms of the dialogue and sharing information among and between us. 
so if my uh, share screen is going to work properly here. I'm just going to pull up a few slides for you. Uh, all right, can people see that? I guess my panelists just give a nod. Okay, thank you. So um, I wanted to, again, as I said, start by uh, situating really um, African Nova Scotians as a distinct people, because I think it would be a mistake for us to talk about anti-Black racism in the abstract without understanding um, that we are asserting or countering issues of anti-Black racism from a positionality as a people, as a distinct people of African Nova Scotians. Um, and so in that sense, um, I want to underline that we are not as a people defined by the anti-Black racism that we have and continue to experience and resist. In other words, we're more than the racism that we endure, um, but instead we do understand our understand ourselves to be a distinct people in the way that you might think about the Acadians or the Quebecois as having a, a particular distinctiveness as a people. And so uh, just a, a definition uh, there on the screen, um, often African Nova Scotian is used in at least two different ways. Um, and the first is the one that constitutes or is the definition of us as a distinct people. Uh, and, and I'll uh, just reiterate it for you here that African Nova Scotians are indigenous black, are distinct people who descend from free and enslaved Black planters, Black loyalists, refugees, Maroons, and other Black people who inhabited the original 52 land-based communities that are part of Mi'kma'ki, uh, that part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia. And so sometimes we, we refer to ourselves as um, Africadian, that's George Eliot Clark's um, name, uh, first African Nova Scotian, Scotian, Indigenous Black, and so on. Um, and just a couple of points about that. It is a lineage-based definition. So, so it's descendants of people who came in those earlier waves of migration. And it's also a land-based definition, it, connecting us to the communities in which we were settled. Another way that African Nova Scotian is used is to describe all people of African descent res residing in Nova Scotia. Uh, and so I just wanted to point out that when we're talking about African Nova Scotians as distinct people, we are referring to that uh, first definition there. Uh, so I just want to make a brief mention of what is probably stating the obvious, um, but a reminder, I think it's always important to remind ourselves that um, in the beginning, Africa was whole. So uh, oftentimes our identity gets conflated into having been enslaved, um, but it's important that we remember uh, that uh, for um, you know thousands and thousands of years, um, African uh, people of African descent who were the first uh, humans to be known on Earth um, had very uh, sophisticated uh, civilizations that existed that traded with other nations across the continent of Africa um, that was um, severely interrupted. Uh, by the European invasion that resulted both in uh, colonizing of the continent of Africa and also, of course, in the transatlantic slave trade, all of which was justified and arguably continues to be justified through both explicit and implicit ideas that somehow um, people of African descent are inferior in some way uh, to whites. And so uh, that ideology was what fueled enslavement um, and also uh, colonization of the continent of Africa. And so I won't say much more about that, but really the point is to remind us that we come from great people and that part of that culture and remnants of culture got carried through to our presence uh, here in, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and you see a little bit there about um, our migration uh, into uh, this area of the world. Um, and I wanted to just uh, say a few words more specifically about that migration. We often um, sort of look at these dates and sort of think of it as a history lesson and so on. And, and um, I think it's important to underscore the significance of the, how our migration shaped who we are as a people. So there's a brief, um, uh, listing of some significant dates there. Uh, most people probably heard of Matthew de Costa, the first known black person to be in the province. Um, but as far back as 1713, we had enslaved African people in Ile Royale, as it was then called, otherwise Cape Breton. Um, and so uh, from the beginning of our presence here in the province, 
we were in a situation of having both slavery being legally practiced uh, in this province, as well as having free black people alongside enslaved people. And so as a result of that, the, the notion of blackness got conflated by virtue of the legal status of slavery uh, as being an inferior status. And um, I think that, that that continues to inform many of our structures and institutions today. So it's important to acknowledge where that arose. Um, now we had um, enslaved Africans come with the New England planters and um, as well as uh, free black loyalists alongside enslaved African people with white loyalists. Um, and later we had black uh, Jamaican Maroons, black refugees. Many of our people left because the conditions in Nova Scotia, including the anti-black racism, racism was so severe uh, that we chose to leave. Um, and then later on, we were joined by um, black workers from the Caribbean in the US, uh, primarily into the Sydney K. Branton area to work in the mines. Um, and so uh, that's a, a sort of chronological overview of the migration. I think there's a couple of important points um, to, to make, and I'll try to, to do this briefly. The first is that um, as a result of this, um, uh, over this migration, um, it wasn't just um, sort of uh, that we came, it was how we came, right? So partly enslaved. And even if we weren't enslaved, the conditions of enslavement elsewhere forced us into this part of the world. So we were fleeing slavery elsewhere, even if we weren't enslaved in Nova Scotia directly. And so you can see how slavery is entirely shaped, how we came to the province one way or another, um, and that arguably we were settled here by those conditions as opposed to being settlers or a settler society in the sociological sense of the settler society. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is from the beginning, our conditions and access to power resources and opportunities were entirely circumvented by virtue of race. So that meant that we, for example, were situated in segregated land-based communities that were um, impossible virtually to sustain ourselves and our families on because of the nature of the land being very rocky. So we were forced into being a, a form of uh, cheap labor akin to the roles of slavery as a result of how that land was allocated. And also we were given much less land. Um, conversely, whites were given much, much more land that they were able to sustain, sustain themselves with and build wealth on. And remember, of course, that all of the land is unceded Mi'kmaq territory that has yet to be fully resolved. So that's the, the sort of overall conditions that we found ourselves in um, coming to this province. And that was sustained further um, by uh, structural racism that those conditions created. So effectively, we lived in two different spheres in terms of being geographically segregated, in terms of temporal segregation, you couldn't even be in white towns uh, past a certain time at night, or you could be subjected to violence. M virtually all public and private facilities were segregated. And again, that was enforced by law. So um, we had legal segregation, for example, in education, and then we had uh, customary uh, segregation virtually everywhere uh, that was enforced by law. The Viola Desmond case is a classic example of that, where she, you know, she goes into a movie theater, there's no law that says she can't sit in a certain place, but when she <laughs> asserts her human rights, the law is brought to bear against her and done so in a way where race is not really acknowledged in the legal system, every, even though everybody knows that that was entirely about race. So those conditions continue today. You think about um, the nature of segregation, it's morphed into what is known by the Human Rights Commission here as consumer racial profiling. So you think about cases like Santina Rayo and others, where again, you are um, being policed by virtue of having a black body. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, street checks and, and that sort of racial profiling as well. Now, it's important to um, say at this juncture and, and um, as we go along again, we're not defined by that extreme racism that we've endured that has shaped the structures that we live in. We are much more um, than that experience. The, the being forced into segregated communities 
meant that we were isolated, but we were also insulated. And we had space, therefore, to perpetuate and grow and create a distinct culture and way of um, living and supporting each other that developed into a distinctiveness uh, that we know as African Nova Scotian culture today. And that includes spiritual practices, political practices, economic development in our communities and that sort of thing. Um, so um, it's important to, again, not only think of our history as being a negative history, but to remember the vast contributions uh, that we have made um, to this province um, and certainly beyond that. Um, and so uh, in terms of um, how we understand ourselves, I think it's important, and this is the positioning that we took, for example, in the Anderson case was to position ourselves as a distinct people and to bring this history into the understanding of the criminal justice system. Um, and our distinctiveness has been recognized, uh, including by the United Nations, as well as by institutions uh, such as, for example, uh, here at Dalhousie uh, University recognizing us as a distinct people. Um, so I'm going to stop there on that point. I don't know, Robert, if there were any questions that came up so far on that. No, there, were, there weren't any questions and I just encourage okay. people to so, place their um, questions in the Q&A. And I'm sorry, that's just gone a little bit longer than I anticipated. Um, but I wanted to jump into now Maria Duga's um, notes about the specific existence of anti-Black racism in the criminal justice system. Um, we're probably perhaps speaking to the converted uh, here tonight in the sense of not disputing that that um, anti-Black racism does exist in the criminal justice system. But I do think it's um, helpful to remind ourselves um, of the uh, statistics that demonstrate that. So where we measure anti-Black racism, we find it. The problem is that we don't measure probably as, as enough as we should. Um, and so you can see uh, here, we have issues of um, over-incarceration, uh, both at the federal level and at the provincial level. Uh, we have issues of um, uh, harsher experiences uh, when incarcerated, right? So, so the number of um, complaints that are brought uh, within the prison system are disproportionately or disproportionate to our population brought by Black Canadians within the system. Um, we have overrepresentation, as I mentioned, um, in terms of incarceration in Nova Scotia. And then, of course, we have some relatively recent data that, that you know, underscores what we have known for generations, uh, for centuries really, which is that we were over-policed. You know, from the time that we were uh, labeled as, uh, you know, um, labeled by virtue of running away from slavery, right? As, as being people that should be rounded up and captured as we're, you know, running for our freedom. That, as far back as that time, set the stage for our bodies being policed even up until today in a way that others are not. Um, and so if you think about the recent um, Wortley report as it's been referred to, uh, we know the statistics of black people being six times more likely to be street checked by police. Um, we also know by virtue of um, a formal independent review led by former Chief Justice uh, McDonald, but a position that African Nova Scotians had taken from the minute that the statistics were released by the CBC about street checks, we know that they are illegal. It, you know, it took a couple of years for other folks to kind of confirm what we were saying, um, but, um, but that did happen, um, the, the uh, understanding that street checks are illegal. Um, but Wortley tells us um, also that 30% of black males in Halifax have been arrested for a crime at some point in their life compared to 6.8% to of white males. And remember, being arrested for a crime does not mean that you committed a crime. So these statistics indicate the level of surveillance that our people are under in, in all sectors, really. Um, and unfortunately, instead of act, 
taking a proactive response to Wortley, we have um, some problematic responses in certain moments, including at times by the Public Prosecution Service, who in the case of Anderson at trial, sought to use police contacts, that is not somebody being arrested or convicted of something, but police contacts as a basis for, ag for an aggravated sentence. So we still have a lot of work um, in order to ensure that the information that comes from Wortley reports and others like it are used um, properly in, in furtherance of justice for African Nova Scotians. Um, I already mentioned um, the over-incarceration rates, uh, so I won't go into to that in, in much more detail. Um, but just note that you know, the, the anti-Black racism does not stop at the doors of the prisons, right? That it continues for people inside the jails and the prisons. Um, and um, that also we have concerns of it, about it across the legal profession and in terms of even the numbers of uh, judges who are on the bench um, and, and the fact that that uh, needs to grow further um, in future years. Um, so I'm going to sort of end there in terms of the, um, the issue of racism in the criminal justice system. We could spend the whole rest of the evening talking about that. And the last thing I'm gonna say at this stage is just that, um, uh, one of the, we're talking about anti-Black racism versus African Nova Scotian criminal justice innovation. And the, on the innovation side, it's important at this point to introduce the IBM initiative. Um, probably people are familiar with the IBM initiative. Uh, it was designed to uh, decrease uh, racism and discrimination in the justice system by increasing the representation of Migvan, African Nova Scotian and other Black um, and Indigenous lawyers uh, coming out of the Marshall Inquiry, and we now have creeping up to about 250 uh, law graduates um, who came out of that initiative. Um, and I think it's important to note that that, that work is, is being led by uh, Kelsey Jones, who is herself a, an IBM graduate. But it's not a coincidence that Brandon Roll, David Curry, Professor Duga, and so many others, including judges, um, who have been at the front lines of this work, this, this quest toward justice for African Nova Scotian and others have come out of the IBM initiative and that network continues to um, affect justice. So I'm going to uh, stop there and uh, stop share and uh, turn things over to uh, Robert, um, who is going to sort of um, talk a, bit, a little bit more about the history of African Nova Scotian innovation and resilience. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Um, I guess much of the history uh, that that Michelle has shared, uh, if you think about it kind of in the backdrop of that history is the story of African Nova Scotian innovation and resilience. I should say innovation, resistance and resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, we, should, we should understand that though uh, people of African descent in North America have this mixed history of both uh, freed and, and enslaved individuals, that they were never a people who were idle or passive in the treatment that they received. And that is certainly the case here in Nova Scotia. If we think about it, the, the uh, the first recorded Black person in Nova Scotia, if we just think about that for a minute, Matthew DeCoste, he was an interpreter with the Portuguese, likely mm -hmm. a North African. And if we think about that, I mean, uh, we haven't connected the dots very well, but in, in, in North Africa, in the Portuguese empire, um, uh, interpreters had a very, very special role in society. They were adventurers. They were, they were kind of the pointy edge of, of, of exploration. And so really, when you think about that individual being here, it represents an individual with tremendous, uh, re with tremendous responsibility and who had already amassed a tremendous amount of knowledge about a diversity of peoples who comes here and settles here in Nova Scotia. In, and they say as early as 1604, and then we had both enslaved and freed blacks here. And you can imagine the cultural exchanges that existed between our freed and enslaved uh, brothers and sisters. And of course, it, there being freed communities here gave enslaved uh, Africans places to run to. 
And so there was tremendous um, protection and collegiality, uh, innovation, resistance in those communities. And if you th we think go back in the the if the 1700s, we have the record record of the first kind of slave riot or uh, race riots in Nova Scotia in Canada in 1784 in Shelburne. And when we think about that, of course, these these folk in free black communities were being targeted because they were seen as taking from white settlers economic opportunity. We need to remember who these folk were, these black loyalists. They were not just farmers and fishers. They were veterans who left the United States to come here as as British loyalists. So it didn't take them long to, to form militias to resist the violence that they were being perpetrated, that was being perpetrated on them by, by virtue of their blackness. And then later on, when you think about the Maroons coming here uh, to, to settle in Nova Scotia, these were not a conquered black peoples, but a people who were treated with by the British and brought to Nova Scotia, who themselves were uh, had tremendous skill as, uh, as, as builders, tremendous skills as military tacticians. So they were, there was a natural fit between them and the many of the black loyalists who after the race riots recognized that perhaps they should seek greener pastures. And so when the Sierra Leone company in the 1790s took <clears throat> freed black folks to settle uh, Freetown in, in uh, West Africa, in Sierra Leone, that these folk were the natural suspects to undertake that work. So we already see before the beginning of the 1800s, this innovation, this resistance, this resilience of Black people here in Nova Scotia. And those are our ancestors, you know. In the 1800s, in the 1830s, we established our first uh, black churches, and not long after, an association of you, the African United Baptist Association was, was founded. Why? In direct resistance to the exclusion of black worshipers from white churches. So in the very earliest part of our time here, we established our own communities, we established our own institutions in order to meet our community's needs. Uh, we, I could go through this year by year, but uh, let's just suggest that, uh, that this is a, a theme that you'll see time and time again, decade after decade in each sector, in the area of sports. Black folk in the 1890s established the Colored Hockey League. Um, you wanted to think of these uh, Black folk as Canadians. They were so Canadian, they established a Colored Hockey League so that they could participate in and grow the sport in their communities where they were excluded, of course, from, from, from white hockey. Uh, not something that, of course, uh, necessarily resonates with me as a non-hockey player, but it is an evidence of the innovation and the desire for African Nova Scotians to be both Black and thoroughly Nova Scotian, okay? Uh, when World War I broke up, out, these folk, again, remember the history of these folk. These were not passive, uh, unskilled individuals. These were the descendants and often they, they were the descendants and they were actually the resistors military resistors who, when World War I broke out, wanted to serve, but were excluded from the Canadian military. And so the number two construction battalion was established to give Black Nova Scotians an opportunity to serve their country on foreign soils fighting this, this war. Black Nova Scotians, time and time again, demonstrating their desire to contribute and their ability to fight against the pressures that would exclude them from participation, often forming their own organizations to do so. Even though the Nova Scotian home has like many and most uh, institutions that were 
uh, caring for very vulnerable peoples at that time. Orphanages have we've we've long since seen the the uh, the the harm that has been caused in those institutions. But in 1920s, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children was established because children of African descent were not being served by the state in other locations. And we could go on. The Black United Front and its organization in the 1960s as a, a political organization to bring the needs and the desires of Black Nova Scotians into the public discourse to ensure that there would be justice and equity and uh, uh, for African Nova Scotians was established in the 1960s. And, and, uh, and they, they established on a 10 point plan, which if you read it, if you, you, you can look it up and read it, it's interesting to read the things that we want. We want freedom. We want free employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black and oppressed communities. We want decent housing. We want education for all people. We want our community to be healthy. We want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people and other people of color and all oppressed people in this nation. Again, if you read in that text, these are black Nova Scotians organizing to advance not just the rights and the interests of black Nova Scotians, but all oppressed peoples in Canada. So it shouldn't surprise us then it was, that it was black activism and black agitation that created the, 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 the framework for the, for the formation of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. Uh, it was, that commission was established initially to address, address the injustices that were experienced by black Nova Scotians or in the language of the day to solve the Negro problem. <laughs> And we can see how that institution expanded in its thought and mandate to address all of the social injustices that experienced by, by, by people in, in Nova Scotia. One could even say that the Nova Scotian Human Rights Commission has lost its way from the point of view that it has taken up the capacity to address the needs of disabled Nova Scotians and queer Nova Scotians, of which I am one. And uh, Nova Scotians uh, in all areas of protected grounds, save for the protected ground of race, where from my perception, the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission has seemed to have lost its way and strayed from its original origin. We could go on, the Black Educators Association, the African Nova Scotian Music Association, the Health Association of African Canadians, the Black Business uh, in Initiative, um, African Nova Scotians have had for the entirety of their time here a history of innovation, resistance, and resilience. And the con contribution to this province of the creation of institutions to advance the needs of the most vulnerable among us. That's our history. And so when we, we titled this anti-Black racism versus African Nova Scotian criminal justice innovation. This innovation goes back to the 1600s and the first people of African descent placing their feet on these shores. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Robert. Um, before coming back to you, Robert, to talk a little bit about the development of Urkas and the X case, um, I wanted to make sure that we um, sort of punctuated another important point in our resistance and innovation, which we may not think of as such, but, but it, it really is an important point along the way here. And that is the case of RDS. Um, most people are, are probably already familiar with that case, but it's important to uh, frame that and understand it as a contemporary example of African Nova Scotian resistance to police brutality and anti-Black racism uh, in the courts and in judicial decision-making. So um, for folks who may not know, uh, you may recall that um, uh, RDS, who is now um, uh, kind of sort of um, indicated himself publicly as Rodney Small, so I, I'm not uh, saying anything that isn't public, 
Um, Rodney Small was himself the victim of police brutality, having been put in a chokehold um, by a white police officer in the African Nova Scotian um, North End community in Halifax around Uniac Square uh, for attempting to help his cousin who had also been detained by the same officer. Um, and instead of charges being laid against the officer for assault or excessive use of force, um, Mr. Small was overcharged with a number of counts in relation to allegedly interfering with the officer's work. Um, and Judge Sparks, uh, the first black judge in Nova Scotia and the first black female judge in all of Canada, after thoroughly weighing the evidence, um, determined that Mr. Small was not guilty. Um, and in the course of making that decision in response to some Crown questioning, made observations about the racial dynamics in the case. And as a result of doing that, um, she had the full weight of the police union and the, uh, and the uh, prosecution service come down on her, uh, then further bolstered by judicial decisions in this province. Now, it was African Nova Scotians through the leadership of people like Rocky Jones, who also helped to uh, start the IBM initiative itself and was a recent graduate at the time, uh, who really came together and um, fought all the way to the Supreme Court for Rodney Small and for Judge Sparks and for the ability to speak truth about race into the justice system in this province. And I think it's really critically important to note that, to note the role of the IBM initiative in that, to note the fact that um, community groups from Nova Scotia were part of the intervening intervener teams that had uh, been involved uh, in the RDS case. And so that was a real uh, case of asserting our voice and within the courts, I think that was fueled in part again by the existence of the IBM initiative, but it certainly wasn't the first one in our history, if you think back to the habeas corpus cases trying to get freedom from being enslaved, um, but it, it is an important contemporary moment along that path toward justice. And I really thought um, that we needed to, to recognize and remember that tonight. Also remember the price that Judge Sparks paid in terms of not being appointed to the then newly formed Unified Family Court, even though she was a senior family court judge, uh, and the community was outraged about that and certainly publicly registered that outrage as well. Um, and uh, the final thing I would say about RDS is just to acknowledge uh, the recent retirement of Judge Sparks after 30 years of service on the bench, despite everything that happened, extraordinary career. Um, and even though um, has the right to retire and, and not do anything else, has taken up a new leadership role as a commissioner with the Land Titles Initiative. Uh, so again, marking that point in our uh, history of resistance and the path toward justice. So I'll turn it back to you, Robert, in terms of the X um, development. Yes, well, uh, so, um, by now, I think people are, are quite familiar with the, ca the case, the R RVX, which is the first case in which a, an impact of race and cultural assessment was ordered. Um, and just to give a, a little bit of background there, um, um, as a mental health clinician, uh, former director of child welfare, um, I had been doing a significant amount of work in the intersection of race and mental health and the intersection of race and child welfare, intersection of race and justice work. And I think that at the same time, um, there was uh, an acknowledgement, uh, perhaps a, a growing acknowledgement nationally and certainly locally that these, uh, that we needed to continue to work against the systemic race, anti-black racism that exists in the criminal justice system. You should remember that it was in 2013 that the Office of the Correctional Investigator wrote its report uh, identifying that the, uh, uh, the differential experience of black inmates in the federal penitentiary was a significant problem. Um, and they had, uh, had not looked into that for almost 10 years. So in 2013, uh, 2014, I had been approached by a number of lawyers already to see if there was any way that I could support uh, them 
in bringing arguments to the court um, related to the race of their clients when uh, clients were being um, adjudicated in cases where their race and the, their, the disadvantage that they had experienced due to race were clearly involved either in their pathway to crime or even in the very nature of the crimes and that these issues were not being uh, properly reviewed, properly assessed at, in, at trial or in sentencing. Uh, actually, before RVX, I had actually written two cultural assessments that were requested by lawyers, but they never saw the light of day. There were such new tools, I think, that, that defense lawyers used them in their dialogue with prosecutors to arrive at better sentences, but they didn't uh, place them before a judge. But in 2014, in the RVX case, I think there was a, a, a perfect storm. There was a a young black man, a young offender who had been charged with an attempted murder. Um, he had been convicted and there were three section 34 reports that were uh, ordered and on file with the court. Now the section 34 reports are essentially pre-sentence reports that are, that are regularly and routinely ordered for juvenile offenders that are conducted um, solely by the forensic mental health team at the IWK hospital. So those assessments were on file with the court and they seemed to suggest as the prosecutor was asserting that the, uh, the, um, the perpetrator in this case, the convicted offender was a seriously criminalized non a uh, non-repentant or remorseful individual who was so seriously and characterologically disordered that he would need a significant sentence in order for him to be, uh, to be rehabilitated or to be not dangerous. Uh, that was what the prosecutor was ass asserting and was actually pushing, I think, for uh, the lawyers can, can uh, perhaps tell us more about this, but I think a life sentence or, or a sentence of 17 years, I think, was what they were gunning for, for, for this young man who had just turned 16 at the time of his crime. And the Section 34 assessments were actually co um, concurring with the prosecutor. These were all assessments, three of them con conducted by psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers at the IWK hospital, all of them white. None of those reports in the thousands and thousands of words that were written in those uh, scores of pages, none of the reports made anything more than passing reference to the, uh, to the fact that the young man in question was black. Uh, and so the defense attorney um, at the time, it, the, uh, it was, uh, came to me after dialogue with uh, many of her colleagues at Legal Aid and said, could you write me a report that uh, spoke to the racial background of this person and helped us have a different way of seeing them? And so having done it a couple of times, kind of in a dry run, I conducted such a report and we called it an impact of race and culture assessment. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why these re uh, reports today are done by mental health professionals is because I needed to write a report that stood up and spoke to the issues that were raised by these section 34 reports that had been done by psychiatrists and psych psychologists and social workers. And Briefly, uh, I found in my assessment, in my interview of that individual, in checking with his collateral contacts, I visited with his father, his mother, his, his grandmother, spoke to individuals in the community who had been previous teachers and coaches and, and friends and mentors. I found a very different person. I found a young person who was a certainly impacted by the criminal behavior that he saw in his community, certainly impacted by the unhealthy availability of guns that was available in his community, certainly impacted by, uh, by these negative things, 
but I found a young man who was still very much uh, yeah, a, a youth who was uh, malleable, whose personality was not set, uh, who was as much the victim of his circumstances in terms of the production or the, the leading to that crime as he was a perpetrator. And uh, I think that the, the judge in the case, uh, Ann Der Derrick, who was then a, a judge at the provincial court, found that that report gave her a different lens from which to view the young person. And that that lens uh, was, uh, enabled her to uh, not uh, sentence the young man as an adult, but to sentence him as a youth. Um, so when we think about the development of that, uh, that assessment, we need to recognize that, but for the work that had been occurring in Nova Scotia Legal Aid, but for the em employment of black lawyers who had natural connections in the black community, uh, black lawyers who had been studying together as a cohort, had been thinking about these issues together, were informing their colleagues, but for the fact that there were black clinicians in the community doing these similar things, uh, had these things not come together, uh, IRCAs would not exist. And, uh, and so we need to, to think about that in terms of, of um, how we work collaboratively to address anti-black racism in the criminal justice system uh, with uh, allied professionals in the community. So I'll leave my comments there. I know that we have uh, much more ground to cover. I, I do note that there is a, a question in the Q&A. Uh, if someone is of African descent and is charged with the first degree murder, can they receive a cultural assessment? Um, uh, I will leave that question in the ether. I know that we have uh, some folk who will speak and perhaps we, we'll, we'll just cover that question as we, we go on. Thank you. So the next uh, case that came along uh, after X was the uh, RV Middleton case, which I was uh, fortunate to be a part of. And uh, that was in 2016. Um, but before I get into the particulars of, of that case, I do think it's important just to highlight and to uh, reiterate a couple of the concepts uh, and this this African Nova Scotian DNA that um, Professor Williams and uh, Mr. Wright uh, have been talking about, um, the resilience and the resistance. So there are two Cs that, that I see as being an overarching uh, concept or theme here is contribution and community. Um, and, so, and so I'll highlight some of those perhaps as I go through the, um, the, the Middleton case and how they are always present uh, when it comes to this this idea of anti-Black racism and African Nova Scotians innovating to, to, uh, to activate against anti-Black racism. Um, again, the contribution and community. So um, there had been this, as uh, Mr. Wright had been talking about, uh, this undercurrent of discussion uh, in the community, in the African Nova Scotian legal community about advancing um, uh, you know, a, a, a Gladu an analysis, analogous to Gladu approach when it comes to the sentencing of African Nova Scotia. Um, so at that time, I was with uh, Nova Scotia Legal Aid, um, and uh, Mr. Roll and I uh, uh, were both with Legal Aid at the time, and we had some discussion uh, on advancing that issue. Um, and the idea here is always to find ways to contribute to the dismantling of the disparities in the justice system. So that goes for whether you're with legal aid or defense attorney, or if you're with the Crown Office, or if you're a judge, um, it, you know, at all levels, um, at, at all involvement, and, and that goes for even whether you're African Nova Scotian or not, but it's particularly uh, a focus of African Nova Scotians to contribute to the dismantling of, a, of the disparities that exist. And so it's in that theme of how do we contribute to that? Um, that um, um, and, it and it was at this time that the African Nova, uh, African Nova Scotians in the law class was offered through the law school through Professor Williams. It was the first year uh, that that had been um, enacted. And um, so I was hi highly interested in taking that course. Um, 
and um, and obviously talked to Mr. Rowland. So I, I wrote legal aid requesting to attend that uh, court. Um, ultimately, I think the first uh, in first instance it was denied. So I wrote back and and reminded them about the uh, Marshall recommendations that required legal aid to have, for lack of better term, experts or folks within legal aid that could speak to uh, these issues as it pertains to the black community. And so what better way to do that than to have the education from the law school in the class. And, uh, and then ultimately uh, they did agree to, uh, to, to provide us uh, the time to go to the course as well as cover the cost of attending. Um, and it was out of that class, again, with trying to uh, find ways to contribute to dismantling that it highlighted uh, the, the path in my view of how we would do that. Um, and the concern uh, from, from my perspective at the time was um, X was a, a youth uh, court decision. Um, and so the utility was diminished, I would say, in, in terms of the adult context. We needed, an, we needed a, a case in the adult context um, that, uh, that, these, that this was applied so that it could have broader reach and, and acceptability uh, in the community. So uh, Mr. Roll and I uh, also went to a legal aid conference um, one year, every year legal aid gets together and has a, a conference and we drove to the conference together uh, and discussed, uh, this was a highlight of our conversation. We discussed this at length. Um, so again, there's the community aspect, the IBM community, there's the uh, resistance, the no's, uh, but still persisting. And it's the community that really gives African Nova Scotians the strength uh, to, to build a resistance. And in that resistance, we're able to um, be resilient and innovate. Um, and so it's in that context um, that Mr. Uh, Middleton's uh, case came along um, with that background. Um, he was charged with uh, assault, resisting uh, police uh, breaches and things of that nature. Um, so run, what I would describe as run of the mill offenses um, but because of his criminal, lengthy criminal record, uh, he was facing jail time automatic for, for, for further convictions. Um, and so uh, we, uh, I made a request um, for, um, obviously the Crown was seeking a jail sentence. I was seeking something other than that, perhaps a jail in the community and probation. Um, but uh, I saw this as, uh, as an opportunity for the uh, IRCA in the adult context to be, uh, to be advanced. Uh, looking at the the right case, um, and also had the right judge, in my view, to um, to uh, to uh, digest these issues and to uh, give us a fair um, um, to listen to these issues fairly and and um, and to and to not set it back. Um, this is a concept uh, I remember Rocky Jones uh, um, reiterating as a young lawyer. I'll never forget it. Um, one of the things he said is the intention might be great. But you always have to make sure you're 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 persistent and not setting the law back when it comes to advancing issues with African Nova Scotia. And so, um, so there was a lot of thought that went into the right case, right judge, all of that sort of thing to not set the law back, uh, but to advance it. And so, in Mr. Middleton's case, as I say, he was charged with those hundred mil offenses. Um, we sought to have uh, the court order a IRCA uh, through um, as part of the pre-sentence report. Um, relying on section uh, 721 uh, sub four. So again, using the concept the court is already familiar with is pre-sentence report, but as part of that uh, order, it, uh, a report that's an analogous to, uh, uh, to the Gladue report, but completed by specialized people with specialized knowledge, education, experience, um, relating to systematic backgrounds and factors of racism that affect the African Nova Scotian community. And so that was the legal authorization that allowed for the, 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 um, the order for the report. Um, and, then, and then after that, uh, I became aware that Nova Scotia Legal Aid wouldn't pay for the disbursement uh, to pay for the report. Um, so I appealed that decision uh, and ultimately it came back uh, at that appeal level to say, no, we're not paying for this. Um, so again, it's that resilience, right? Uh, but still finding a way to contribute. So I took those, um, um, refusals for, for disbursements uh, to, the, to the judge and uh, clearly laid out for her. This was a legal aid client from an African Nova Scotian background who obviously couldn't afford to have these uh, reports uh, paid for. And obviously legal aid uh, was unable uh, 
uh, to do it at the time. Um, and so the responsibility lies with the court. If you want to come to a fit and just um, sentence, um, and if no one's prepared to pay for it, the obligation's on the court, in my view, to, uh, to cover that. Um, ultimately, the judge did agree with that, and that was the first case where the court uh, paid for a report. And so it was distinguished in that, uh, on those two grounds, in my view, uh, that it was the first adult context where these reports were ordered by the court and paid for by the court. So it set the groundwork uh, for, for the cases that followed. And again, um, it's in that spirit of contribution and, and community. And that was highlighted throughout that, throughout that case in terms of getting the objective uh, uh, that paved the way for the other cases. And, and I believe uh, Mr. Rolls is gonna uh, comment on the next case that came after that in, in the line. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess before I do that, I just want to uh, pick up on uh, some of the things that you mentioned about, uh, first of all, acknowledging the panel here, you know, the expertise on this panel is, is um, you know, bar none, right? This is the best <laughs> that we have. And uh, there's a couple of themes I would suggest uh, if we have students on the line, find your people, right? Robert says that all the time, find your people. Uh, you're gonna need those people uh, for support as you do this work. Um, the other piece there is you can bring these ideas into the practice, right? That's an exciting piece for me. If you're a student, things that we talk about in law school, bring that into the practice. And, you know, we're figuring out the pathway to do that. Um, the other piece that I noticed as well, you know, that amazing historical context that was laid out by Professor Williams and uh, Robert. To me, that's the baseline of knowledge that is required if you're going to serve African Nova Scotians in the justice system. So we think about things like judicial notice. Um, yes, we can take notice of, of slavery and systemic racism, but do you actually know the story of African Nova Scotians? And I thought that was one of the subtle things that Justice Derrick did in Anderson was uh, to say, you know, judicial notice is not enough. We need that historical context because that story uh, would otherwise not be told or even known in some cases uh, when we think about all of the different locations across the province. Um, so I thought that was an important piece. And to me, like that's the baseline. That's where you start when we're having this conversation. Um, so to pick up on the cases, I suppose, uh, Gabriel would have been the next one. And so around this time, um, Mr. Curry, I, I wanna call him DC, you know, this is my guy in law school. Mr. Curry and I were having these discussions um, and then Gabriel came along and this might speak to the question as well. This is a young man who was charged with murder, ultimately convicted of second degree murder. And uh, an IRCA was ordered um, in that case, uh, but it was to inform parole and eligibility. So the impact on sentence is a little bit different. Um, but at that time, I'm connecting uh, to someone named Faisal Mirza in Ontario, and that's back through Michelle, right? So Professor Williams, excuse me, um, connecting uh, with Professor Williams, who puts me in touch with Faisal Mirza, and that becomes important later because he's arguing these line of cases in Ontario um, that are picking up the mantle and bringing this sort of to the national uh, scope when we think about IRCAs. Um, Gabriel, I would suggest, was an incremental step forward. Uh, Justice Campbell devoted about 40 paragraphs to discussing the IRCA um, and the value of the IRCA, but he, he sort of struggled with what do I do with this information? You know, how can I reconcile moral agency versus these constrained circumstances? And, you know, I would suggest we got stuck there as a province for about four or five years, uh, or maybe two or three years, um, in any event, with judges saying, you know, I appreciate that this is important, but I don't necessarily know how to apply this to the sentence um, to the benefit of African Nova Scotians beyond acknowledgement. And Professor Dugas touches on that uh, in her paper, which, uh, again, to me is a must read if you're going to do this work. Um, so after Gabriel or during the time of Gabriel and the following years, we see uh, Jackson and Morris come out in Ontario. And again, that's that link, Faisal Mirza is arguing those cases. And Justice Nakatsuru really sort of lays the groundwork um, to establish that pathway to mitigation. Yes, we can acknowledge that constrained circumstances diminishes moral blameworthiness and actually impacts the sentence. If we're going to arrive at a just sentence, that was the next step that needed to be taken. And that was the piece I, I would suggest we were missing here for a little while. Uh, so Jackson and Morris picked it up. And then as we're doing that work, uh, we're thinking to ourselves, oh, Morris might go up, you know, to the Supreme Court of Canada. It did go to the Court of Appeal and they had asked us to intervene. 
we weren't in a position to do that, but we thought let's get ready if it goes up at the Supreme Court of Canada. And so we're connecting, we being, you know, Legal Aid uh, is connecting with Professor Williams, Professor Dugas, uh, my colleague at Legal Aid, Lisa Shigeri, and we're doing this work to get ready in case Morris goes up. What would we say? How would we bring the Nova Scotian voice into that proceeding? And as we're getting ready for that, um, Anderson comes along. And so, uh, you know, that was the case that was here and we were ready uh, to make these arguments. But before we uh, dive into Anderson, I think this, this was a transition point to talk about the importance of that academic work going on behind the scenes as we're building, um, you know, our legal arguments, the necessity of that partnership. So maybe I'll turn it over to Professor Williams now. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's sort of two other pieces to introduce here before we get back to Anderson itself. Um, one is the work of the African Nova Scotian Decade for People of African Descent Coalition, or ANSDPAD as we call it for short. Um, that formed um, after we had organized a real cross section of African Nova Scotian organizations to make submissions to the U United Nations Working Group of People of African Descent, the Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent in their uh, Canadian mission visit uh, here in 2016. And Halifax was the first stop on purpose uh, because we were sort of the cradle of uh, Black um, culture in the country. And so out of those um, that organizing, the coalition was formed and one of the first issues that it took up was the issue of street checks, which you recall were first came to the fore in this part of the country by virtue of the CBC investigation that was done and reported on the street check um, numbers. And so um, the, what became the Justice Strategy Working Group of the ANSD PAD coalition uh, was and continues to be very active in its work in part because of the street check issue, but also because there was a real gap. We have a lot of other African Nova Scotian organizations, but we have not had, um, certainly since Buff, a Black United Front, an African Nova Scotian justice organization. And as we were doing all this work off the sides of our desks, um, we realized we really had to think through um, building an institution like that, that could continue this work more formally. And that started our conceptualizing, visioning what an African Nova Scotian Justice Institute would look like. And so I think it's important to bring that layer into the discussion because that was happening parallel. And as a result of the Justice Strategy Working Group and the ANSD PED Coalition work, um, we were able to join with council like Brandon Roll um, through Nova Scotia Legal Aid to um, apply for and were granted intervener status in the Anderson case. And, and it's because of, I think of the body of work that we had built up publicly and otherwise that we were granted uh, that intervention status. So I wanted to um, uh, highlight the importance of that and going back to um, David Curry's words, going back to the importance of the community and the commitment and the contribution that was made by virtue of the uh, coalition work. Uh, the second um, point that I wanted to make is really going back to on behalf of Professor Juga, uh, but making sure that this point gets made. And that is to talk about the importance of the academic contribution to this work. Um, and uh, in link to the IBM initiative again, uh, but also to the question of judicial education. And so I'm going to be drawing directly um, from her notes here. Um, so she says, for those uh, who don't know, um, and I'm going to read it in her words, if you don't mind, because it's just easier to do it that way. But this is Professor Dugas speaking, not me. Uh, for those who don't know, I published an article in the Dalhousie Law Journal in the summer of 2020 on the need to include IRCAs in sentencing decisions for Black Canadians. I wanted to highlight that I almost stumbled into this work and now appear to be one of the leading experts on the topic. She's very modest. She is the leading expert on the topic in terms of academic work. Um, that is, uh, she says, that's not to brag, but simply to say you never know where your career might take you. So another point for students who may be on the call um, to note that. She says, I was introduced to IRCA's by now Judge uh, Ricola Brinton and Krista Thompson, the lawyer who argued X while I was articling at Nova Scotia Legal Aid. I was immediately curious uh, why they weren't being used in every case uh, and why and how the Crown was arguing against them at the time. 
I thought if there was an academic article on point, then maybe the courts would have something to rely on going forward in doing this work. Um, and she notes, judges don't usually go out on a limb and want some authority for novel arguments. So the importance of the academic work and research here. When I decided to go back to school for a master's degree, I knew I wanted to write about this topic. I ended up taking Professor Williams' African Nova Scotia in the law course and happened to be there at the same time as Brandon, although I knew him previously through my work at the Nova Scotia Legal Aid. I workshopped early drafts of the paper with Brandon and other folks at Nova Scotia Legal Aid to make sure the paper I was writing would be useful to them in arguing cases. Somehow this also led me into judicial education. I happened to be clerking at the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal at the same time that Justice Derrick was appointed there. I also submitted my paper as a writing sample when I applied to the court, knowing that the judges, at least those on the hiring committee, would have to read the paper that she had done. Um, Shortly thereafter, Justice Derek contacted me to ask if I would be interested in participating in a judicial education conference on the topic. Since then, I've done multiple uh, National Judicial Institute, NJI for short, events for judges across the country. This enabled me to get in front of the judiciary and talk about this work before the case was decided in Anderson and before a lot of the provincial and superior court judges were seeing the reports in their courts. Um, for example, I'm doing an NJA conference uh, for PEI judges um, in May. So I think there you can see as, as um, Professor Juga notes, the importance of the academic side, the research, the publishing to um, provide judges and, and everyone um, who's interested in the issue with, with deeper thought and analysis of um, the issue of IRCAs, of the development doctrinally of the case law. Um, in order to help lay a foundation for understanding and a willingness for judges to uh, move forward in the direction of, of burqas as one small, um, I think, remedy uh, for the centuries of anti-Black racism that informed the criminal justice system. Um, so I'll now um, give it back over to Brandon uh, to talk about Anderson itself. Thank you. And I, I guess I'm just thinking as you're speaking, the other benefit of work is, from my perspective, has been, we're going to make you talk about this in court. You know, the history has been, we'd rather talk about anything else other than race, but this forces the issue. We're going to talk about it, and you're going to have to give judicial commentary on it. You're going to have to make decisions based on it. So, um, yeah, it's been amazing to watch it evolve. But in Anderson, uh, I didn't argue that the case below, that was argued by Drew Rogers of Nova Scotia Legal Aid. Um, just briefly, the facts, he was 23-year-old, young African Nova Scotian, uh, stopped at a random uh, traffic stop, um, pulled over. The officer, uh, as he pulls him over, goes into his computer, sees that Mr. Anderson has a record, sees that Mr. Anderson has criminal contacts, sees that Mr. Anderson has these uncharged contacts with police that Professor Williams spoke of earlier. And on that basis sort of um, determines that there's an officer safety issue and, and searches Mr. Anderson. And, and during the course of that search finds a um, a loaded uh, handgun uh, on Mr. Anderson. And so uh, the charter issue was argued at trial um, on the basis that the search was not charter compliant. Judge Williams found that it was, and, and Mr. Anderson was ultimately convicted of five uh, weapons offenses, including uh, possession of a prohibited weapon, a loaded a prohibited firearm. And uh, during the course of the sentencing proceedings, uh, Judge Williams was really proactive, right? So um, I think she may, uh, so, the timeline, I think, was uh, Drew Rogers said, you know, we'd like a, a, a PSR with a, a cultural component. So a pre-sentence report with a cultural component um, that comes back. We know that probation doesn't offer that. So that comes back without that component. And then uh, an IRCA is ordered, in fact, of race and cultural assessment. And that comes back. And, and uh, Judge Williams says, you know what, I'd like to hear from uh, Robert Wright, who uh, was the supervisor of the author who wrote the report, who's Natalie Hodgson. I'd like to hear from Jude Clegg uh, about what's available in corrections. I'd like to hear from Sobas Benjamin about what's available in the community. And um, she used her power under the criminal code to, to call that evidence, which is power that judges have that they don't often use, um, and pulled those witnesses in and um, got amazing testimony from all three and decided to, uh, on the basis largely of what was in front of her through the IRCA, impose a, a conditional sentence order, a community-based sentence. And, um, you know, part of the story that we'll tell later is that 
uh, part of the discussion in, in Anderson was, you know, do I send this person to jail where I know he will fail or do we give him an opportunity with culturally appropriate programming in the community? And part of the story is that, you know, it's been working, he's doing well. So that's, um, that's a piece that we might talk about later. But ultimately, uh, we get that decision from the Crown. Professor Williams talked about some disturbing themes that were, that were put forward by the Crown. Um, but the Crown decides to appeal that decision and uh, they, they appeal it under this umbrella of, of seeking guidance. And um, that caused some, some different reactions from the community. You know, why are you appealing a positive decision for an African Nova Scotian um, you know, that led to a positive outcome? And you know, this guidance piece, in part, I think the Crown's rationale was it was a provincial uh, court decision. We don't know what superior courts are going to do with this decision. We don't know what direction this law was headed. Uh, but that initial decision, um, you know, it, it's worth analyzing. Why are you appealing? And so um, I'll turn it over now to, to Mr. Curry, um, perhaps just to talk about, um, you know, that Crown perspective um, when the matter was appealed, and then we can discuss further, you know, how the appeal came together and, and what that looked like. Well, I'll just say briefly that the Crown, the Attorney General has a right to appeal. Um, and that uh, right is to be exercised uh, with restraint and in the public interest. And when we're looking at appealing uh, uh, sentence, there are basically five criteria that the Crown must take into consideration. The first one is the uh, um, whether or not the sentence is contrary to the, um, uh, the criminal code, uh, the position taken by the Crown in the court. Um, if there's an error in principles, number three, Number four, if the sentence is too low or if it's manifestly uh, inadequate. And the fifth and final uh, round is um, if, they, if the Crown's seeking um, some sentence guidance in the court. And that's a particular ground that was used, as I understand it, in Anderson. And it's important, I think, uh, to kind of uh, note a couple of things about uh, Anderson that I felt was um, different. Uh, for lack of a better term. First thing is the Crown position changed over time in terms of their appeal. Um, that I would, uh, at least to my experience, is rare, uh, especially how, how much it uh, varied over time. Um, the other, I think, important aspect was that, um, now you have to keep in mind that the uh, Crown attorneys uh, at the Public Prosecution Service for Nova Scotia, you have an appeals division that kind of deals with and makes these decisions um, that's separate and apart from, for example, the, the, um, the Crown, not, not in all cases, but in, in, in a number of uh, cases, including Anderson. Um, and in this particular case, um, the appeals uh, division did consult with the Equity and Diversity Committee within uh, PPS, um, and that's uh, uh, co-chaired by Ingrid Brody, uh, QC and uh, Josie McKinney. Um, and there's a number of um, uh, folks on that committee that do very good, uh, solid, continuous work. Uh, and part of that work was uh, at least, I wouldn't say consulted, but there was discussion between that committee uh, and uh, the Crown Office, uh, the Appeals Division throughout that, uh, that process. So there was at least the opportunity for input from the racial context. Um, and I do think that that, again, I would suggest is, is unordinary. Um, in any event, that's kind of the background. The, the main thing is that the, the crown position shifted over time. I think it started with, a, uh, or at least at one point, it was about um, seeking a test from the court in, in terms of being able to apply a particular test. And perhaps Mr. Roll could speak uh, more uh, succinctly with respect to that, but then it changed to the seeking guidance from the court uh, approach uh, that he spoke about earlier. Yeah, I think initially the, the grounds included a piece about uh, challenging the expert evidence that was dropped, and then it was this idea of an exceptional circumstances test. So in these exceptional circumstances, um, we can grant a conditional sentence order for offenses like these for African Nova Scotians. And that was problematic for a couple of reasons, right? You're, you're creating these barriers that didn't exist in the first place that are perpetuating the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, 
and you're applying a new test in law, essentially, it was the position that we took when we heard that um, uh, position taken by the Crown uh, that, that didn't apply elsewhere. And so now you're bringing in a test that didn't apply elsewhere specifically for African Nova Scotians is, is the position that we took uh, in response to that. And so, um, you know, the intention of the Crown, that, that can be discussed elsewhere, but what it looked like was this, you know, exceptional circumstances test that hadn't been applied before, wasn't really necessary and was contributing to uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. Through discussion uh, with council, I think community applied pressure as well against the Crown position and, and through the committee that uh, Mr. Curry talked about, that position ultimately evolved into something different and that exceptional circumstances piece was dropped. Um, eventually, but I think it's also worth noting here, you know, how we organize this strategically in terms of the litigation. Um, the Justice Strategy Working Group um, was contacted, but within legal aid as well. We were representing Mr. Anderson, so we had to go to apply to legal aid, and, and they were flexible enough to say, yes, you can also represent the intervener. Then we had to select the intervener, uh, which is a process as well, and we approached the coalition. The coalition's not five people. The coalition's a huge group. So how do you structure it so you're getting feedback from the community through the coalition and through the justice strategy working group? So all these relationships that have been built over the years now are coming into play in developing this community-led strategic litigation that actually presented the historical context in Anderson, that actually presented the model on how you apply this evidence, uh, which was ultimately adopted. So we see the community having a voice and changing the law in Nova Scotia. And that to me uh, was an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, so, you know, that process in and of itself is critical race practice in action linked directly to all the things we've been talking about, you know, the historical piece um, mixed with the, the IBM and the community piece. Um, it was all coming and merging at this one moment in Anderson. So that's why it was uh, to me a, a very special case. And I don't know, Professor Williams, if you wanted to talk about some of the, the main takeaways from Anderson, because there's been a lot. Um, but, you know, Justice Derrick, again, it's not a coincidence that Justice Derrick uh, heard X, that Justice Derrick, you know, at one point rep or worked with, um, you know, Dr. Jones. You know, those things aren't a coincidence and it's all part of this theme that we're talking about. So. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there and perhaps turn it over to Professor Williams. Yeah, just uh, echo a couple of points about the, the process of the case. Um, uh, you captured it so well that the, the community through the coalition. So when I say coalition, it's a coalition of 30 plus African Nova Scotian organizations from across the province, plus many, many hundreds more individual members. And so um, it's it really one of the main ways we have in this province governance wise to bring the voice of African Nova Scotians forward collectively. And um, the coalition, I think, was certainly concerned about why this case was appealed in the first place when it when actually it worked right I mean the IRCA actually did the did the right thing and, and was applied. Um, but also. Uh, we were very concerned about um, the position that the Crown took in the first instance, that some exceptional circumstances test, some higher bar was going to have to be met by African Nova Scotians in order to um, avail themselves of a conditional sentence in these circumstances. Um, and that that was a, really an untenable position that the Crown was initially taking. Um, uh, so, and, and, you know, as a coalition, we have the ability to bring those arguments forward in court, but we also have some other ability to, um, you know, publicly discuss our concerns and situations. Um, and um, as was mentioned, um, Justice Derrick, of course, wrote um, for the entire court and, and um, there were five judges. Um, and so, you know, the court was taking the matter clearly very seriously and signaling that, I think, in, in terms of the hearing itself. Um, there are there are there is so much to take away uh, from the Anderson case, um, and I guess the first thing I would say about it is that if you are in criminal practice in any way, uh, representing or working with an African Nova Scotian person, you must know Anderson inside out, in my opinion, because although it's a, a technically a sentencing decision, certainly the principles I think that Justice Derrick forwards in terms of understanding the African Nova Scotian experience in the justice system apply to the system as a whole. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight um, four key points and, and uh, pull up the screen uh, to do that. Hopefully this will work again. Um, and so, uh, here we go. 
So um, the first point is, um, in my assessment, um, Anderson reframes the methodology for sentencing of African Nova Scotian offenders. Um, in that uh, through providing a detailed analysis of how systemic anti-Black racism impacted Mr. Anderson's life and choices, and also indicating to some degree how the law itself has been complicit um, in reinscribing anti-Black racism. And uh, what I uh, certainly find interesting about this case, although I'm not sure that, the, that Justice Derrick or, or other members of the bench uh, would so identify it. In my assessment, it is clearly a critical race case, or it's grounded in a critical race approach, insofar as it centers the history and context and lived experience of African Nova Scotians, and it calls upon um, lawyers, uh, judges, to not only examine how an existing sentencing rule is applied, but it tells us that we have to actually uh, sort of pierce the veil, if you will, of that existing law to determine whether other sentencing principles are themselves infused with anti-Black racism and to interrogate those as well. And so just briefly, it's not just you know, whether this uh, sentencing range should apply to an African Nova Scotian offender in this particular circumstance, it is asking, is the range itself just? Or was the range developed uh, built upon anti-Black racism that was infused in the criminal justice system? And so that is a, a really, um, I think, a progressive and uh, critical race approach to ask, to, to ask the decision makers to interrogate the law itself. Um, the other thing I would note is that it requires judges to take account of the social context of uh, racism and historical injustice um, and to explain how they're taking account of that um, and uh, sort of not just to treat it as a check mark, but to actually engage and preferably to write the reasons. So I think there's a push toward the decisions themselves forming an educative or playing an educative role as the law progresses um, in, in informing others who read the decisions. Um, and then finally, I think um, a really important point is this issue that, uh, or the importance um, underscored by the fact that if uh, judges don't engage in that level and depth of analysis, that that is potentially an error of law. Uh, so those would be uh, four things that, that I would highlight. There's much more in the decision and then that's why I commend it um, to everyone to read. And um, so Brandon, I don't know if you wanted to pick back up in terms of um, comparing or, or drawing some observations about uh, Anderson and Morris, which was decided shortly thereafter or somewhat thereafter. Yeah, I, I think I want to stay on Anderson for a moment, just to, to say the intention of keeping it broad and contextual and saying this is a lens through which you'll apply sentencing principles uh, was so valuable because, you know, we've talked about this, uh, Robert, and, you know, and the panel at large, this work is in its infancy, you know, we're talking about 2014, when, when the first IRCA was written. And so there are, there are ways that this will grow that we haven't even thought of yet. You know, and to that point, I got an email today from somebody who was involved in a case as a victim, and said, I want to talk to you about how valuable the IRCA was um, through my experience as the victim, how it framed the uh, offender in a different light, how it changed um, my victim impact statement to a message of hope. And so that's not a that's not a a use of Minerka that I would have ever thought of. And so I just think it was so valuable that that the court adopted this contextual approach to allow um, this type of of sentencing, this type of law, to grow um, rather than try to place it in a box, which has been the approach historically. You know, we have to try to peg it down somewhere. It applies to this sentencing principle, but maybe not over here. And maybe that's a good segue into Morris, where I guess the first thing I would say about Morris, the Ontario Court of Appeal case that was sort of happening at the same time, one of the factors that was really interesting was it was argued before Anderson, but Anderson came out first. And 
you know, from my perspective, that was a really good thing because Anderson's actually picked up quite a bit in Morris. Um, and so the message that I, I guess I'd like to share about that case is that it also is a net positive case in terms of the outcome in Ontario. In Ontario now, the sentencing range is different um, because of Morris. A lot of these principles are infused in that decision. So there are ways that the decisions are different. Um, the focus of the court is a little bit different. They disagree on certain points, but ultimately it's uh, adopting, you know, this the same principle that you have to apply these factors at sentencing for African Canadians. You have to acknowledge that this can be mitigating on sentence if you can establish diminished moral blameworthiness and, and sort, of, uh, sort of showing you the pathway there, maybe not as pronounced as Anderson, but you know, in, in speaking with the folks in Ontario, that case it's doing it is doing its work. Anderson is doing its work. We've seen the provincial court pick this up uh, in terms of saying this is a call to action and we're going to change the way that we sentence African Nova Scotians. I think you could have a, a very long discussion about both cases, uh, but I think the important message is um, we are evolving. You know, the law is evolving. We're moving forward, and both cases were a, a real step forward that were not separated. We were connected with those folks doing that work. Everything that we talked about before happening in Nova Scotia informed the way that they're doing it in Ontario. And, and Faisal Mirza and the people out there will be the first ones to tell you that. Um, so, you know, this is, speaks to the national impact that African Nova Scotians are having and will continue to have as we know that IRCAs are going to roll out nationally with this federal funding. And so, um, Perhaps I'll, I'll leave it there on the Morris piece because I know we probably want to engage in some some questions and mm -hmm. other discussion. Yeah, and I think Robert is going to pick up on um, the way in which Nova Scotia has become the national leader in rolling out IRCAs. Um, I just wanted to add one other thing, um, and that is the degree to which the court was informed by uh, the work of Professor Duga. And again, the importance of that research work and the publishing and, and the thought that went into analyzing the line of cases to that point that the judges could refer to. So Robert, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, I, I would just, uh, and I'm not going to speak long because I think we, I'm, I'm eager to get to the questions, uh, uh, but to just to say that uh, as you see how we go from the ancient history, if you will, of African Nova Scotians to this current location of this concerted effort by this community of practitioners in various sectors pushing back against uh, systemic racism, anti-Black racism in the criminal justice system. Um, uh, we have this community of people who've been working together really evolved into um, seeing the need for an African Nova Scotian organization that was designed specifically to address justice issues. And so we, uh, some of us who had been involved in DPAD, who had been involved in these discourse, these conversations for decades, framed in 2019 the framework for what we imagined as an African Nova Scotian Justice Institute. And again, I just want to, to go back to say that this was not a new idea. We were simply breathing life and considering structure for something that had been envisioned by our ancestors. People who have been alive and on the field and working as recently as Dr. Rocky Jones, to people who came to these first shores and uh, were agents of change and, uh, and, uh, and advocacy for African Nova Scotians from the earliest days. And so we framed up an African Nova Scotian Justice Institute. We imagined what it would look like. We imagined what, it, what its purpose would be. We imagined how it would be staffed. And we presented that model to the uh, Department of Justice here provincially and were successful in getting funding. So in the fall of, the, oh, I'm sorry, no, in the summer of 2021, the provincial government uh, funded us to put make alive this thing that we're calling an African Nova Scotian Justice Institute. And we have been developing its activities. And uh, by next week, we'll have uh, begun to staff it significantly uh, to continue this work that we've established. Yeah. So 
Now back to you, Professor Williams. I, or perhaps what I'll do is I'll start to look at some of the, the questions that have, have been in the, in the chat and, and we can start there. I guess the first question is, someone asks, if someone is of African descent and is charged with a first degree murder, can they receive a cultural assessment? So um, if someone is convicted of murder, so remember the impact of race and culture assessments uh, are going to apply to sentencing. So if someone, if someone's convicted of murder, uh, yes, you know, you can order a cultural assessment. Of course you would if it was an African Nova Scotian, but the way it's going to impact the sentence is going to be different, um, you know, because murder carries a life sentence. You're really at that point arguing about parole uh, eligibility and what that number should be. Um, so it's a little bit different context, but still extremely valuable and it should be ordered in, in every case. Yeah. We, we have another question that, that Megan Neves asked the question, does Nova Scotia have organizations that work to help the African Nova Scotians who've been wrongfully convicted? And um, I think that that's uh, perhaps uh, a question for really, how will the Justice Institute organize to begin to address those kinds of cases, not just issues? Yeah, and I think you can extend that to people who are being wrongfully prosecuted before you get to that point. And I think uh, ANSD Patton has been active in that area and uh, will continue to advocate on those cases. I think it's fair to say we, we sent an open letter on the Riley case saying uh, we don't believe that there's a realistic prospect of conviction, uh, but the Crown is pursuing that. And, and that's an example of um, you know, a case that we feel is being wrongfully prosecuted. And that's the type of work that we want to take up. Uh, but of course, we're just building this infrastructure and, and those wrongful uh, conviction cases require significant, significant resources um, to fight. And uh, you know, Innocence Canada will, will assist with people in Nova Scotia. But to Robert's point, how do we build that um, homegrown same approach uh, for our people? Can I just add one point on the wrongful conviction? There is a specific recommendation, well, at least one, more than one probably, in the Marshall inquiry about how wrongful convictions should be dealt with. And that was not followed by the province in the case of Gerald Barton, who was a historic wrongful conviction case. Um, so there is a lot of work that needs to be done there, even to live up to the Marshall recommendations. Perhaps even, even uh, studying and understanding the the nature of wrongful conviction and how wrongful conviction occurs uh, speaks to how we need to establish uh, prosecutorial and judicial and police practices that would mitigate against wrongful convictions in the first place um, uh, is something that we should be which should be think we should be thinking about. I mean, the science around wrongful convictions has. I think this, the seven points for wrongful conviction, you know, tunnel vision, um, eyewitness testimony, uh, uh, things like systemic discrimination and racism. Uh, these are known factors that contribute to wrongful convictions, which if addressed in police training and in prosecutorial training and in judicial training would uh, address the issue of wrongful conviction before, there, there are wrongful conviction cases. That's interesting. Just, um, there, we've got a couple of other questions. There's the one here. Can all of the successes in Nova Scotia be translated to all people of African descent in Canada? Uh, this is a really interesting question about the generalizability of our work. We speak often about African Nova Scotians and we speak about the unique and distinct nature of African Nova Scotians. But of course, not all black people in Nova Scotia would be uh, African Nova Scotian by that definition. And certainly, uh, what is the generalizability of this work to people of African descent across the country? Anyone? I thought you were going to keep going on that, Robert. <laughs> uh, <I> <laughs> I'm asking the questions tonight, Brandon. <laughs> well, I think it speaks to, you know, as we think about 
uh, and I know Megan Longley asked that question. Um, so thank you, Megan. And uh, Megan was uh, uh, CEO of Legal Aid when, when we were doing some of this work and was uh, very valuable in, in pushing this work forward. But I, I think it speaks to, um, you know, when we roll out these IRCAs nationally, you know, how are we going to identify the experts in that area that know their community, that know the specific uh, history in those jurisdictions, right? The, the Black population in Ontario is obviously much different than the Black population in Nova Scotia, same goes for Saskatchewan and, and BC and Manitoba and out west. So, you know, it's, I think it's about finding the expertise, and, and that's why I thought you were going to pick this up, Robert, uh, in those jurisdictions to uh, make sure that the court does get that comprehensive history and pathway um, to the courtroom um, that you see in, in the African Nova Scotian impact of race and cultural assessments. Uh, but to me, it starts with the expertise. Like the reason that these reports are so effective here is because of the expertise behind the reports. And that's what was required because we knew, and it has brought itself to bear, that these reports would be challenged in a way that no other reports have been. If we think about pre-sentence reports, uh, how often do you see the pre-sentence report author dragged into court and cross-examined. I would suggest that's very rare. If we think about Gladue reports, perhaps a little more often, but still pretty rare. If we think about IRCAs, especially when they were first introduced, I would suggest it was almost every case. Okay, you assessor, tell me who your collaterals were. Tell me what records you looked at. What about this? What about that? So the expertise has been challenged from the beginning. I thought it was a very strategic um, decision to say, we are going to write this from a forensic lens to the point that it must be accepted. And um, that's the standard I think that has to be set across the country as we roll these out. Yeah. That's great. And the experiences of, you know, of anti-Black racism are not unique, obviously, to African Nova Scotian. So whether someone's in Ontario or Saskatchewan or wherever, I mean, there's those, those two main uh, overarching concepts of community and contribution. They've made a contribution to their communities um, and um, you know it's the community itself that'll be able to uh, to do that work in my view to, to to find the experts who are there they're known to that community um, and so it's an easy it's easily transferable across the prop, across the country uh, because we have uh, you know uh, work is being done at uh, at all levels to try to combat anti-black racism always been the case um, and so the community itself will be able to identify those uh, who are our experts to be able to, um, you know, to create that work in that area that's specific to that to that uh, to that community. Can I just add? I think it's important wherever you are that it's not anti-black racism in the abstract, right? And this is this is the importance of asserting ourselves as a distinct people and talking about the way in which we have experienced anti-Black racism related to who we are as a people and our history. And I think that, that the challenge is anywhere in the country, if courts are not prepared to see the whole person of African descent in relation to their community and their culture and so on, then they've done a disservice in that moment, but also to the collectivity to which that person is connected. Well, I, I would say in answer to the question then, yes, there is a generalizability here. And I think that the principles that you just articulated, Michelle, are important. So that if we are, we are writing an IRCA on a person of Haitian descent who happens to be in Montreal, we will talk about anti-Black racism as it is applied to Haitian immigrants in Montreal talking about the history of Haitian immigration to Canada, talking about the, the, the way in which Quebec has had some influence over its immigration such that it is able to select individuals who come to settle there uh, using an immigration process who are first language French speakers. And then to talk about how uh, French immigrants have been received in Quebec and what their experience has been, what their history of systemic discrimination has been both in Quebec and perhaps even the colonial nature of the history of, of Haiti and how that has impacted people. Uh, and then bringing what we know about the psychological impacts of that on the individual, the social impacts and what that does in terms of fomenting an environment of, of criminality, uh, the systemic discrimination in policing and, and the like. So we have learned how to do this here. 
And in fact, Nova Scotians, Scotians have been asked to stand up the training for assessors across the country. Uh, and we've already begun to do that. And we've been seeking those experts across the country who would be able and qualified to become IRCA assessors. So yes, people of African descent, no matter where they are. I think another question that is being answered is, can this model be applied to other peoples, other than people of African descent? The obvious answer to that is yes, but I would say in the same way that the Human Rights Commission was established to address anti-Black racism and very quickly upon its establishment left its original mission to take on the needs of other peoples mm -hmm. and actually lost the capacity to understand the needs of Black people. Let us secure this, role, this tool as a tool of anti-Black racism before we allow it to run away from us and become a principally a tool to address anti-Asian racism or anti-immigrant racism. Uh, just give us half a minute <laughs> to hold on to this tool to start to address anti-Black racism before you uh, give us the responsibility to train uh, other peoples to use it. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of that, but again, just, just give us a half minute. I'd invite people to, to ask their questions in the Q&A section, and uh, I, I'll go to a, a question from Isaac Sawa, who, who admits that this question is a bit of a niche question, but have there been any innovations in response to algorithmic discrimination in policing? Uh, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, while some folk uh, try and answer on this, I might Google algor algorithmic discrimination <laughs> in policing. <laughs> Any comments on that? Uh, I would say quickly no, in the sense of the work that we've been doing hasn't veered in that direction. Um, uh, you may be aware that um, Dalhousie is sort of um, picked up a project, I think primarily led through the computer science department that may be creating some space to think about these issues. Um, but through the uh, coalition um, or the Institute, I, I, and I'll defer that part to Brandon, I'm not sure that it's, it has come up high on the agenda, which is not at all to suggest it's not important, um, but, but for the most part, no, we haven't waited in there. Well, I think the, the, the second part of the question is about risk assessment for parole. And so that issue of risk assessment within corrections, I think is an area that we definitely want to focus on. I know Robert is doing some work with corrections, you know, applying these, um, these risk assessment tools, these generic tools uh, to racialize folks um, doesn't give you, um, you know, the, the comprehensive outcome that you want when you're talking about, you know, how do we deal with this um, African Nova Scotian person in front of me or African Canadian person in front of me, this risk assessment tool may not be the most effective tool. So that generically, uh, to, to answer the question, is an area that we definitely want to focus on. And I don't know, if, Robert, if you wanted to pick up that, that work that's happening in corrections. Sure. Uh, just teasing a little bit there about algorithmic policing. So, so really, um, in the 19, hmm, I want to say the 1970s, sociologists really got taken up with the idea of mathematical models of predicting human behavior. And there were some folk who said, we could use math to figure it all out. Um, and, uh, and I think that that really laid the foundation for these um, these actuarial models for assessing things like risk in policing. And so if we think about the VRAG and the SORAG and these kinds of actuarial tools that are used by social scientists to predict the risk and the recidivism of particular individuals, that these tools have been used extensively in, in uh, correctional assessment and classification assessment, parole assessment and the like. Um, they, they're problematic from a number of points of view. Uh, first of all, I would say that these tools are designed in laboratories and the people that they again, that, that they, they are applied to don't live in the same laboratories where the tools were, were created. Um, so that's one of the problems. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that 
These tools were not designed uh, with the full diversity of, uh, of Canadian citizens in, uh, in mind. They certainly were not also designed with an understanding of the influences on uh, people's assessment of recidivism and even the construction of the tools like the idea of anti-Black racism being written into an actuarial assessment. So if you think about it, for example, a person who is incarcerated who doesn't have a residence to be um, discharged to is actually a higher risk person than a person who has a residence. Well, who does that discriminate against? Is that an actual actuarial um, uh, factor that contributes to risk or are we just locking up poor people longer than people with money? Right? Because many people who, who do not have income lose their residences upon admission into an institution and if people are socially isolated. So anyway, uh, I won't, I, I digress. Uh, currently, so for about the last 15 years, I've been talking about the need to steer clear of actuarial assessments in predicting risk for people of African descent. People who are of African descent go into our correctional facilities and using those tools are assessed at the highest risk for classification. And yet black people have among the lowest recidivism rates upon discharge from prison. So there's clearly a mismatch between our tools for assessment and the experience of recidivism. Um, so for 15 years, I've been talking about this and for 15 years I've been ignored, but recently, the Ontario um, uh, branch of the Correctional Service Canada has been designing new training for probation and parole officers and the folk at Carleton University, in particular Ralph Saren and his team at, the, at the, the risk assessment lab there have been asked to kind of review that work. And I've been contracted by them to, pro to be a part of a team of individuals who are giving a cultural lens to that training. And I guess without telling tales out of school, I will just say that the cultural lens that is being applied to the training has demonstrated the need to go back to the drawing board. Uh, if we're going to have probation and parole officers accurately assessing the risk of diversity of peoples, we need to take a, a, a journey away from actuarial tools and look at these socio-cultural models for understanding risk that can only come from a rich understanding of history like we've presented to you today and what IRCA's attempt to bring. Um, so I guess that's what I would say, that, that that's where we are in Canada in terms of this idea of, of pushing back against um, uh, actuarial and algorithmic models for policing and for risk assessment. And I hope, Isaac, that that's answered your question a little bit. Uh, I uh, flinched at it, but uh, hope that's been helpful. You had that great answer ready. You just wanted to see us struggle with it first. <laughs> <laughs> It is a very interesting thing, though. I mean, uh, uh, this back to Urkus too, doesn't it? You know, we, yeah. we, we talk about that uh, risk as well. You know, the information, someone's bearing their soul in an Urka and will divulge things about who they associate with. And then how does that get used in corrections when they classify a risk? Are they using those associates to then um, determine a higher risk at the corrections level? So that's an area of focus as well. How do we mitigate that before it arrives at corrections? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Josie asks an interesting question. Is this change rate algorithmic assessments also happening for forensic dangerous offender and long-term offender assessments? Um, not yet, <laughs> but, uh, but we're, we're on the case, I guess is what we'd say. Um, um, risk is, no, let me say this. Uh, I've been, um, in addition to doing this work, I'm a sex offender assessment and treatment uh, 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 specialist. And, uh, and so risk assessment as it relates to sexual 
offending and reoffending is something that's been a tremendous interest interest of mine since the mid '90s, and uh, and uh, we are as a a tool, a group of people, those who, experts in in assessing and treatment uh, of sex offenders, we are really pushing against this. It's not just a race thing. Uh, it certainly is a race thing, but those who work with those populations are recognizing that they're, the tools that we're using are really not great tools. Um, we have for whole classes of offenders really stopped assessing them as whole human beings and have assessed them as perpetrators of very distinct offenses. And, um, and uh, you know, urkas are a tool that could be used and in these dangerous assessment uh, hearings to bring, as Judge Derek said, a, a different lens through which to see the offenders. Someone asks if the Institute will look at child welfare law, and if so, how can this work on IRCAs be translated to this era, area? Any takers? I, I, again, I'm not gonna speak for what the Institute is gonna do, but I, I would note that um, Professor Duga um, is taking a look at the child welfare issues and has a, a small grant uh, that she was awarded to do that uh, here at Dalhousie. So, uh, there definitely, will, I think, will be some move in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I guess there are these questions keep coming up. And, and what I would say is this, uh, and I don't know many of the people who are on this call, but I will point out, and I say this all the time when we talk about IRCAs, if it wasn't for the fact that Krista Thompson called me up and said, hey, can I talk to you about the possibility of writing an assessment on a file of mine? I would not have been the pioneer of IRCAs, but for that call. I would have just been a community practitioner running around talking publicly about ideas of race and justice, right? <laughs> so it took a lawyer who was litigating a case that involved a very a, a real live person in front of a real live judge to call a person like me into that discourse for Urkas to become a thing. So although I'm, uh, you know, I, and I often say, and Michelle, that I find, I feel like a spectator when I'm on these panels because the work is initiated by legal practitioners who have an innovative mind to push against these things, uh, and in particular, anti-Black racism in this case. So if you have a question as to whether or not these kinds of arguments can be brought to a dangerous offender and long-term offender assessments, then uh, go find an expert and invite them into your into your case and find a way to advance that argument. Um, I am not an academic. Well, I mean, I'm not a practicing full-time academic whose job is write, writing and research. I'm a community practitioner, right? Who uh, created IRCAs because of my practice, not because of my scholarship. And I would ch challenge you when you have a question like this, particularly when the literature is vacant, to innovate within the context of the community of practitioners that you have surrounded yourself with because you've known that that's how best you should practice, to innovate a solution to the question that you're advancing. Remember that Professor Duga's academic work came after the RVX decision was made. So in that case, the practice preceded the academic and analysis. So as a practicing lawyer, you're on the front line, you know? And I look to, to people like uh, Mr. Roll and Mr. Curry 
these are these are giant innovators who are out there pushing the envelope, standing on the frontier of what is currently done and known, and just taking another step. <laughs> well, judge, you need this 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 material to make a good judgment, so you really should order it. Never been done before, but you should order it and pay for it. And the judge said, hmm, I guess you're right, Mr. Curry, and ordered it. I am wondered, uh, Mr. Curry, could you speak to what did it take to do that? What did it feel like to do that? If we're talking to people who are legal practitioners, uh, did it take courage? Did it take boldness? Did it take, I don't know, what did you eat that morning for breakfast? I, <laughs> well, it how takes does one practice that way? Yeah, it takes all of that. Right. But at the end of the day, it goes back to those two things that I mentioned before community. So you have to have you have to have the willingness to, to have these discussions with other African Nova Scotians uh, and others that are practitioners that practice in the area to to sort out the how. Because we don't want to set anything back either by just trying to push forward, because we've seen that before as well. You want to push forward in a way that's going to be successful to advance the issue. So. That, that it's developing a community uh, to help you get around the no's and the obstacles. And it's also about this willingness to contribute. You have, so to me, there has to be an intention right from the beginning that I'm going to find a way to contribute to the dismantling of the disparities that we know exist in the, in the criminal justice system and finding ways to do that. And, be, oh, you're, and that, that's the guiding principle. And then you find the ways in the system to do that. Whether, again, whether you're, it's on the uh, criminal defense side, if it's family law you're practicing, if you're a judge, if you're a crown, develop programs, develop uh, um, the, the, the community that allows you to contribute in a way that dismantles a system that we know is disproportionately um, and disparagingly affecting uh, 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 you know, the aboriginals and uh, and African Nova Scotians. So yeah, so so when you say what it took, it, it's the conversations and it's the, the intention that we're going to try to address and dismantle this. And to me, it was very easy because it was low hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned, uh, because we already had Gladue since 1999. And that, that's been here um, and it's the same section. It's analogous to that. And we looked at overrepresentation. Um, the numbers are, compared, are, are as bad or worse for, Af for African Canadians as they are for Aboriginals across the, the country. Um, so in those two communities in particular, for, 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 for the hist historic reasons, right? Uh, um, and so it was ripe for the picking in terms of, of course, that that would be applied. Uh, and then it's just a matter of finding the law to back up um, what the intention is. And the how was what took the most, the most uh, time, uh, in terms of what law you'd be following. In, in terms of, um, and again, I remember uh, Chief Justice Kennedy telling me as a law student that if you want a judge to step out and do something, um, build the branch for him to step out there. Um, and those words stuck with me, you know. And and it's a part of that branch that uh, we developed the how to. What what's What's the authority that we had asked a judge to do that? Um, and it's out of necessity that that kind of uh, played itself out. But um, yeah, it's about finding a way to, we all should be, look, not only African Nova Scotians, but certainly all lawyers should be looking for ways, especially criminal uh, lawyers should be looking at ways to contribute to the dismantling of the disparities, no matter what your title is. And maybe I could follow that up. With Robert, a oh so yes, are we at time for time? Yeah, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and and just want to make sure that um, uh, we respect people's uh, time in, in joining us tonight. And so um, I'm happy to, if anyone wants to stay on, but for folks who um, uh, have been here with us tonight, just wanted to thank you um, for for coming with us. I'm sorry we sort of can't see you and have that level of of dialogue, but. Certainly um, appreciate your presence here um, and, and um, your interest 
uh, in this topic. And so I just wanted to say that to, to folks as we say uh, good night. And um, uh, I'm happy to stay, Robert and others, if, if you wanted to talk a little further, so. Perhaps we should, we should leave the conversation there and look forward to the next conversation. Yes. And I, I think that as, as we have uh, done this work, we have, uh, we have uh, established uh, a, a lot of the practice elements of this work and, uh, and have, have identified the experts in the work. Um, I will just leave with one last question from a, a, a longtime colleague and sister social worker of mine, Janice Aitken, who's, who asks, do you see a place for allyship from non-African Nova Scotian people within the current criminal justice stakeholders to assist you, or do you feel it will take the continued push from only African Nova Scotians to achieve your goals? And I don't know who, who, who will answer that last question. It's always both, I think. Yeah. 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 I, I, I would just remind people that Krista Thompson was a white woman. Mm -hmm. Krista Thompson, who was the lawyer in the X case, was a white woman who had a community with black legal practitioners in her office who happened to have the right case and she used the community connections that her office mates had to reach out to find this tool. And I guess, Brandon, as you take on the mantle of the Director of Legal Services for the Justice Institute, I would imagine that, that you would see the Justice Institute as a place not for white practitioners to unload these questions, but for white practitioners to come to gain support for the work that they want to do in this work. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it ties back into the last question too. I was thinking about that. I'm not a family law expert, but what can I bring? Uh, so maybe it's a strategic partnership with people like Shauna Paris Hoyt, Alicia Brown Fagan, who have been introducing this idea um, of cultural assessments for parental capacity assessments, for example. Um, let's merge the practitioner with the in-house expertise that we do have, the, the roster of experts that we know are flexible and can, and can adapt these types of reports to any environment and provide the strategy and consultation. And so, yes, of course, that's what we're gonna do in the criminal justice world as well. The majority of judges are still white. The majority of practitioners are still white. That's where the shift needs to happen, right? And so it goes into things like establishing accountability through criminal law practice standards, which we're doing. Uh, holding people accountable, but also providing support as they advance these arguments. And, you know, that's, that's the beauty of the work. We can be housed in a single place, but provide access and consultation and support across the province. So uh, ideally that's how we're going to do it, but we'll see how it unfolds. And yes, we need the allyship to move the profession forward and the law forward, of course. Can I, can I just add, you know, I think, um, that the, the, the small p political leadership and direction and visioning has to come from the African Nova Scotian people about what we want for ourselves. Um, but there's so much landscape to cover, right? Once you, you, you kind of charted that course that we really do need allies to work with us in that. And one book um, that I found very helpful that I share uh, with my class uh, very early on in the course is, I think it's, is it Anne Bishop? I'm sorry, I'm not recalling the exact um, name, but I think this is about the third printing. Um, and it's a really oh. great, yes, how to be an ally. Yeah, really great. Really great. Um, I find it very helpful in terms of trying to be an ally with groups that I'm not, I, I don't identify with myself, but want to support. Um, so I would recommend that as well. I'm sure people are already kind of aware of that too. Yeah. So uh, let's tie this in a bow. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, well, I, again, I just want to say what a privilege it is for me to be in the company of these folk on this panel. Like I say, I often come to this space and feel like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a spectator to these folk who are uh, just the movers and shakers and uh, legal leaders in Canada on, on addressing the systemic discrimination that exists in the criminal justice system. And uh, 
And we have come together as a community of practitioners, uh, bringing our academic chops and our uh, criminal law practice chops and our community clinical practice chops uh, all together to mix up this uh, great gumbo that is the uh, current manifestation of the uh, history of African Nova Scotian innovation and resistance. Um, and uh, you are living in a time where you are our colleagues and our friends, and uh, we look forward to practicing with you uh, in the days and the weeks and months to come. So maybe, uh, Michelle, if you want to have the last word, I'll let you say good night. Yes, I, that's all I will say is good night and thanks and, and everybody stay well till we meet again. Bye-bye. Bye for now.